you. That will be that will be the Fab Friday presentation on February 17th. Want to just say we're glad to have you. And for, in terms of questions, questions, the first question and answer period will come after Dr. Bill Cedarberg uh, finish his his uh, part of the presentation. And Bill O'Connor will be taking a live microphone around in the in the live audience first, and then we'll be taking questions from the Zoom audience. Um, after Bill stops speaking, I will be getting up to talk about healthcare issues with broadband. So we're very grateful to have you. I'm going to introduce Dr. Bill Cedarberg. Sitter, so here we go. So here is Dr. Bill Cedarberg. Uh, got it. So Dr. Bill Cedarberg, we are glad to have him today. He is a retired university president from Ferris State University, from Utah Valley University, and from UNC Wilmington. He is a board member of the North Carolina Arboretum and with Common Cause and with the AB Tech Foundation. And he's chair of the WNC Broadband Initiative and he's a grandfather to Ryan. It's my great pleasure to present Ryan, to present Bill. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you, Karen. You'd probably rather hear from Ryan in any way. He's uh, kind of a hilarious character. So uh, it's an honor to be here today and to join the, uh, the festivities. First of all, I should mention, I'm going to uh, just mention that Mark Zarnacki was going to be joining us today, but he came down with COVID yesterday, and we didn't want to see him. So Mark is not able to join us today. Well, my role is to talk about a project that I've been involved with for six years involving UNCA students and faculty and administrators, and that's called the WNC Broadband Project. Uh, it was created six years ago at the request of Jack Cecil and Janice Brummett, uh, and the idea was that what can we do in this region uh, to support broadband uh, activities. And over those six years, our students at UNC Asheville have been involved in establishing a website and social media presence. Uh, we've held four leadership summits hosted by the chancellors of the universities. This is Mary Grant hosting a summit two, three years ago, I guess it was. Now. And our NEMAT program at UNC Asheville has been instrumental in working with mapping where Wi-Fi is and where Wi-Fi is not uh, throughout Buncombe County. We've used multimedia students through uh, the multimedia class uh, to create products for our social media sites. Uh, this is Julia talking about the um, Apple industry in Henderson County. Uh, we also create uh, policy recommendations for our local legislators, and uh, we have uh, three students currently working on uh, analyzing and studying what those policy recommendations should be uh, for the future. Our current projects are three in, in total. One is working to promote the affordable connectivity program. We'll talk about that more in a little bit. Uh, working on our current policy recommendations uh, this is just a slide from last time where we identified the top five, and you can see what the top three were last year. We'll go into a lot more depth with our students this year as we look at the policy environment. And the third initiative is to look at a leadership summit again uh, for 2023. This is just a slide of the agenda from 2022, and you can see that we involved uh, Nancy Cable, the chancellor out here, uh, the president of, Jan of uh, Dogwood Trust, Janice and Brahman, and then Kelly Brown, the chancellor at uh, Western Carolina University, were kind of our co-hosts. And we'll be doing something similar to that uh, this year. Now, my role today is to talk about broadband, talk about the increasing reliance on broadband technology, uh, and then share a few comments about the current initiatives that are underway. Karen Sanders knows so much about this healthcare issues and how broadband is related that we'll ask Karen to speak about that. And again, Mark won't be speaking uh, because he is not very well. So Mark, hello. I know he's on Zoom at home, so I hope you're feeling better. You sounded terrible this morning, by the way, when we talked to you. So first of all, broadband basic, what is it? It's simply high speed connectivity uh, to the internet. Now when we say high speed, 
What does that all mean? Well, there's a lot of definitional debate about that. Generally speaking, the state of art is about 25 megabits uh, down and three megabit speed up. Uh, whereas the world standard really is now 100 megabits down and 10 megabits up. And if you look at Korea, which is the, the world's leading country, and that's South Korea, the world's leading country uh, in broadband access and speed, we're far, beyond, far behind uh, countries such as South Korea uh, and others. So this is just a graphic talking about the data coming down from the cloud out of the pipeline going to your computer, and then when you click something to respond or you input some data, that information goes back up uh, the chain to the cloud and to the provider. Huge issue, and our students will be talking about that in the policy document, and that is we really need to have some standardization of what the high-speed definition is. You'll see sometimes as you drive along a road a little sign that said sign up for high-speed internet, and really what they don't mean high speed for a world definition, they mean low speed, but they can talk about it being high speed because it's a little bit faster than a telephone line. Second basic, uh, what do you need if you uh, have uh, internet? Well, for a Netflix movie, you need about one megabit per second uh, uh, download speed. If you want high definition, 4K, many of the videos now are for 4K definition, you really need five megabits to 25 megabits per second coming down uh, from the cloud. Otherwise, you'll get buffering. So if you're uh, watching your TV and you're trying to watch a Netflix movie and it buffers, that means your speed is not adequate, particularly when the high definition videos are trying to be downloaded. Interactive gaming, if you're at home and you're a teenager and you are busy playing all sorts of uh, war games, et cetera, particularly multi-partner war games, it is a very significant drain on Wi-Fi speed. Uh, in fact, the speed generally drops dramatically late afternoons uh, because teenagers are home using uh, that technology. And if you have lots of devices, you need uh, at least 25 megabits per second or up to one gigabit per second download. Now, if you're interested in all this arena, you may want to do a speed test. This are two websites that you may want to look at, speedtest.net or okla.com, and you can test the speed of your internet uh, at home or on your cell phone. Uh, this happens to be the speed that we have in uh, Biltmore Lake, and it's good service from Charter. I've been talking to Karen uh, Sanders about this. She gets about 15 megabits, and where we are uh, at Biltmore Lake, we get 500 and some uh, megabits per second. They also provide information on where the data is being transmitted around. So bloomnip.top.com uh, actually is a private uh, fiber company that transmits the data through their private networks. And so you can see in the circle area, you'll have uh, bloomnip and then going to spectrum and then down uh, to the house. We know that there's increasing reliance on broadband in every part of our life that we have. Uh, in education, as Karen mentioned, I've spent my life in higher education. We now have about 31% of the students throughout America are taking a class online. 98% of the universities provide classes online. Uh, it is clearly having a disruptive effect on higher education traditionally. Uh, we know that cash is disappearing. In fact, there are some certain countries that are talking about uh, removing cash totally out of the marketplace and going strictly to credit cards and financial uh, transactions through the internet. We also have 46% of the employees in America say that they're more productive with online services. And so you see company after company trying to figure out how to improve productivity with the use of technology. Karen's going to be talking about this, but 59% of the public currently uses online services to getting medical information. 41% of the public uses government, use the internet for downloading government forms, like I did this morning, uh, to get out of jury duty. If you're older than 72, you can get out of jury duty, so I downloaded that form. So uh, I'm one of those. Uh, if you uh, like working at home, our daughter lives in Arden, works at home. Her job is in Michigan. We now have about 34% of the public work either totally at home or spend part of their time 
uh, working at home with the internet. And the statistic that I enjoy the most, talk about social impact, uh, that is that 25% of all married couples in America have met online. Uh, and that's probably not true of the Ali membership, uh, but uh, it is increasingly uh, true for younger populations. Now, in uh, 2016, we created the West Next Generation Network and then the uh, WNC Broadband Project. And this chart shows the increase of volume worldwide on the internet. And there's a great term called exabytes, uh, which is just a huge volume of data that's flowing over the internet. And you can just see the exponential increase in uh, data uh, that's flowing. And I jokingly say, oh, well, that's because of our good work. But it's really not. It's due to increased application complexity, uh, more and more features, more and more uses, such as MRI results and stuff like that from your doctor's offices. We also have the internets of things you might have heard about, and that is that increasingly machinery is being connected on the internet and interfacing with us. And uh, I use this as, a, as an example on your uh, refrigerator, uh, but there's lots of other examples, like uh, I just was intrigued the other day and I asked um, uh, Alexa how many people were watching Korean uh, movies on Netflix, and it turns out to be 60% of all Netflix users have watched at least Korean, one Korean movie. Total irrelevant for our group today, um, but uh, I found it interesting. Now this is a concept that Karen and I fell in love with when we were at another meeting, and that was the idea that we can build upon Maslow's hierarchy of needs, uh, and that at the base of that needs is connectivity power through Wi-Fi or some other means. Uh, and in fact, this statistic, I think, I don't know that I necessarily believe, uh, but 75% of people say that a week without Wi-Fi makes them grumpier than a week without coffee. So uh, I don't know. Uh, I'm not a coffee drinker, so it's kind of hard to relate. But on Maslow's hierarchy needs, physical and mental health issues are there with the internet, safety issues. If you don't have fiber, the public safety network falls apart. Uh, social media, Facebook, uh, all the various social media sites. Your self-esteem, you see young people now will have one million followers on, uh, uh, on Facebook or on TikTok or something. And at the top of the line, you self-actualized people. Now, self-actualized people uh, is the goal of Ali, but there are, I have to throw out, there, have to, there are some real significant drawbacks to this connected world that we live in. Uh, and that is, this is a great book if you have an interest in that. It's called Stolen Focus, and it really talks about how we are losing the ability to really focus on items and to concentrate because of this highly hyper-stimulated uh, world that we live in. So Karen and I are thinking about this thing. Do we know somebody that's self-actualized that's at the top of this uh, group? And we came up with Catherine Frank. So Catherine, uh, we recognize that, and... Uh, will use you as a role model uh, in all of this. There are different ways broadband is delivered. Uh, one way is the new technologies that I'll talk about very briefly. Uh, we have the older technologies that are based upon the telephone wires that connected the homes and the cable TVs that connected the homes. Uh, and then the most recent are fiber. And fiber, of course, is the gold standard because it's cheap. It's massively, you can handle massive volumes of data transmission and it lasts at least 20 years or more without having to be replaced. And we don't know how long it'll last in total, but that's a huge plus uh, for the industry. Satellite TV is here. Uh, this is Starlink. You heard of Elon Musk and his uh, initiative. Uh, I checked it out where I live on Lake Drive in, in Inca. It's not available yet, but when it is available, it'll cost us about $100 a month. So if you're out in the middle of nowhere uh, and there's no other provider, Starlink is a potential uh, in the future. A fixed wireless for the mountains, if you are in a holler somewhere, uh, fixed wireless can be useful as the, there's a tower and it'll beam a signal down to an antenna on your house. Uh, and there's a company called Skyrunner that specializes in this that we work with. Uh, and it's a tool that's been very effective in some of the more isolated communities uh, in the mountains. A big player currently is 5G. This is the fifth generation technology. 
Uh, 3G is an older technology, and as you drive out of Asheville into the more rural areas, you'll run into 3G. And 3G isn't particularly helpful uh, with video and what have you, uh, but it's still here and still visible. The next generation was 4G technology, and that's largely available and has been available here in the Asheville area for some time. Uh, and that can deliver 12 to 30 megabits per second. But the new generation is 5G generation. And uh, they're now starting to offer this as an option for delivery to your home. So if you're in the mountains somewhere uh, and one of the providers has a tower near you, you might be able to get internet uh, connectivity uh, through uh, uh, your, your phone. This is my phone outside of our, our house. And if you'll notice that 5G is delivering 500 gigabit, not gigabits, megabits per second to our house. Now, Karen's going to talk about this a little bit. And where she is, it's closer to 20. Uh, and so the difference is absolutely huge. And there's huge fu potential uh, future uh, for 5G. So the huge build out is underway that you need to know about when it comes to Wi-Fi connectivity. Uh, we have federal programs, uh, such as the BEAD program. We'll talk about it in a second. We have state administer federal f f dollars that are flowing to North Carolina from some of these stimulus packages that the feds have passed. And then we have some specific grants uh, that are available uh, and have been supported by the state legislature. I have to say, in this age of political polarization and uh, the divisiveness within our society that broadband has been something that has received the support of both Republicans and Democrats. And it is one of those issues that cuts across the political divide. And it's been delightful to work on that for that reason, that you don't run into the same polarization. The big uh, funding agent in all of the broadband expansion is the BEAD program. This comes out of Washington, D.C., and it's the Broadband Equity Access Deployment Program. Uh, and the, the feds are giving out $42.5 billion to expand broadband. So uh, you're going to see a lot of activity on broadband in the future. Now, when I presented this before and Karen was in the audience, I think she was kind of struck with the next uh, charts, people don't give any thought really to really how is, how, when you connect to the internet, how does it all you know, flow? How, but, well, you should know that public internet and educational institutions, public libraries, police agencies are using the MCNC network. And it came about because of the federal stimulus in 2008. And this is kind of a graphic of the big pipelines of fiber that run throughout the state. If you zero in on Western North Carolina, uh, it really follows the university patterns. So uh, you'll uh, be up here in Boone at Appalachian State. Uh, it'll come down over here to Marshall, go down uh, Interstate 26 to Asheville, then it'll go down here uh, towards Silva in Western Carolina, and then it loops around. These are the big pipelines of fiber, and they will handle the great ball. And you'll notice right here that Asheville is a key and a hub in that. And about a half mile from where we're speaking today uh, is one of the hubs and uh, uh, connects. And you wouldn't think about it. And it's not known because as a public safety, public safety people don't want anybody to know about this stuff because it would be a natural place for uh, some potential damage. So because of that $42 billion, because of the commitment of the state legislature, we're going to see about $3 billion being spent on uh, fiber cable uh, over the coming months. And this is probably totally irrelevant to anybody, but I find it fascinating that you have uh, orange cable. If you're driving along the road and you see people burying this cable, that's fiber cable uh, that's being buried. And you're just going to see a lot of this going into the ground uh, over the next uh, few years. In 1996, the Federal Communications Commission declared that broadband was not a public utility. It's not like telephones. It's not like um, uh, all the sewer systems, or it's not like the public transportation or whatever, or highways. It's a private good. And as a private good, there's really no major role for local governments. Uh, there's no governmental mapping of services. You go into the county and say, I want to see a map of where fiber is in Buncombe County. You can't. They don't have it. Nobody has it. 
uh, and hence there's not a lot of expertise locally. Uh, there's no ability for you as a citizen to complain about your services. In the old days of cable TV, the, the local government would franchise your cable TV company. You could complain to your local government when they renew their franchise. You don't have that ability. The funding that I talked about all goes to private companies to expand their services, not public agencies. And because of this, we now have a really a significant digital divide uh, between areas where I live, Biltmore Lake, and you saw that 500 megabits per second download, and we got two or three options of who can we can contract with. Uh, but in another area like Broadview or, or, uh, or different parts, Woodfin, for example, is a problem locally in Buncombe County. There's all sorts of different parts where we have uh, divisions between areas that have Wi-Fi and areas that do not. In Buncombe County, uh, we have 13% of the public that do not subscribe to any internet service. And that's compounded by this fact that 44% in a survey that was done a few years ago didn't have high speed at all. They had 10 megabits down and one megabit up. And increasingly with all these applications, that's just not adequate uh, for, for society. So we have some very significant problems. NEMAC the other, day, the other year helped us do a map of Buncombe County. This is where Wi-Fi is and where it isn't. Uh, and I won't get into all the details, but essentially a guy that we work with by the name of Stag Newman, who is the chief technologist with the FCC, said this is a Swiss cheese problem. It's not like huge blocks of land don't have Wi-Fi. It's you might have Wi-Fi here and then down the street you might not have Wi-Fi. So. Uh, we're trying to figure out a ways how do you fill in uh, these gaps. And there are various efforts not only to fill the gaps physically but also to deal with the digital divide and time is such I don't want to get into all of these things but there are digital equity grants that are floating out, there's programs called Complete Access to Broadband and then the state has as part of the bead funding uh, a requirement to work on digital uh, equity. Locally, Dogwood Trust has been very influential and active in this area. They have helped finance digital plans for each of the counties, and those are all available online if you have an interest. Uh, here in Buncombe County, the library system has been very supportive and can supply to digital uh, assistance to individuals. Our local planning government, Land of Sky, has been very involved in this over the years, and. Uh, They've developed the plan, Bridging the Digital Divide as a Buncombe County specific plan. And I'll put this as a promotion. On the 26th, there's a webinar put on by uh, Land of Sky, and these will be state leaders talking about bridging that digital divide here in this county. Our current activities, and I covered a lot quickly, but our current activities are really focused on uh, the Affordable Connectivity Program, which is one of the federal programs that has been created. It is providing $30 a month of assistance for broadband for citizens that qualify, and the qualifications are basically anybody that qualifies for uh, the, the series of federal programs such as Medicaid or school lunch programs and others. They can get $30 a month and they can get $100 one-time grant. Uh, and we are attempting to zero in on that issue and we have brought two people here today uh, to talk about that and Claire why don't you come up. Claire Tomlinson is a student at UNCA. She comes from uh, Hickory, uh, North Carolina. She is in pre-law uh, and uh, she has done a phenomenal job in putting together some policy documents uh, for us and in uh, working on the ACP. So Claire it's always great to have a real student doing this. So, Claire, it's yours. Hello, everyone. Uh, like you just said, my name is Claire Tomlinson, and today I wanted to show you all the flyers that WNC Broadband made in the past few months. Have this. this one? Okay. Uh, we made these in the past few months to talk about the Affordable Connectivity Program. And like he just mentioned, and the gist of it is that it's a $30 discount, a monthly discount um, for eligible households, and then $75 if you reside on tribal lands, and then a one-time discount of $100 off of a device if you put a co-payment down between $10 and $50. So it's a little confusing, but one-time um, device discount, and then for every month that you're enrolled, you get $30 off. So our two flyers, the one on the left, and if you read the banner at the top, it's obviously not what we've talked about yet, but 
when the federal government released the ACP program back in 2021, there were 20 service providers that partnered with the federal government to offer plans that were $30 or less. So the result of this is that people can enroll in the ACP and then once they enroll, they can partner with one of those service providers that are listed and like two thirds down that first flyer and then they essentially have zero dollars charged every month to their internet service which is really awesome and um, i had the opportunity to not only just hand these out but like we're doing today speak about them and i always just want to mention this aspect of the acp because while thirty dollars off is incredible getting free internet is even better um, the second flyer is just getting down to the nuts and bolts of the acp um, most importantly we just want people to see if they qualify um, go to websites to enroll and then you know, the third step is finding an internet service provider because the ACP is not a direct check written to people, it's sent to service providers. So there is that third aspect of it. And um, the whole goal of these flyers is just to get A, people interested if they've never heard of the, the programs. And like, like I said, when I spoke to people, they maybe had heard of the ACP, but they had not heard of the plans that were $30 or less. So we wanna bring attention to that aspect of it. And then also just to give them resources, there's a number on the first flyer and then on top of that we have um, internet URLs to follow. Okay. All right, so this website is called uh, affordableconnectivity.gov. It's the FCC's homepage for the ACP. The reason we like sharing this resource is because if you see the top banner, you can start from not knowing anything about the ACP, seeing if you qualify, um, applying, enrolling, managing your benefit, having companies, seeing if you wanna switch companies. So basically everything that you need can be found on this website and that is why it is incredible. Uh, so this is included on the second flyer, but we also just give people this URL because everything that we you know, say can be reiterated on this website and more. All right, just to touch on qualifications, I know Bill said a few things about it. Um, we just want people to remember that it is such broad eligibility standards. You can first off see if you're eligible through your household income, which is at or below the 200% uh, federal poverty line. Um, and then on top of that, if you're already enrolled in particular federal programs, like he said, this includes SNAP, Medicaid, WIC, SSI, I know Pell Grant recipients receive it. Um, on top of that, veterans, pension, uh, survival benefits, there, there's a ton. So we encourage people to get on and look. Um, it's not just those three listed right there. And then if you're a lifeline benefit, which is another program offered by the FCC, and then on top of that, some in internet service providers create their own like income eligibility standards, which is incredible. So they do mention this on the website, um, and we also say that as well because it is just kind of up in the air and like I said, very broad. But point being, a lot of people apply and a ton of people have enrolled in the ACP since it was introduced in 2021. And those numbers of course keep growing, but we could still see a significant amount more people enrolled, especially in North Carolina. And then the last thing I wanted to touch is this other website. And unfortunately at the time we made the flyers, this was not published. Uh, GetInternet.gov is Basically, it contains all the information of affordableconnectivity.gov. It like um, includes direct links to that website. Um, it gives kind of more background information. It's just a different layout. It's also great though, and what I really particularly like about this website is that it can like it has an updated list of the internet service providers that participate in the plans that are thirty dollars or less. So we were just talking about it earlier today. Our flyers, flyers were made roughly two months ago. So we like to include, while we're, especially while we're talking about these now before we get them updated, that this website is what contains you know, the, the actual list. Um, and I don't believe those are changing anytime soon, but yes, I just wanted to bring attention to this website and that's, that's all I have to talk about. Thank you, thank you, Claire. I, I can't tell you how excited I was that I was able to tell you what button to push here on the, um, on the thing. <laughs> As you, as you get older, that's exciting, you know, it's, uh, you know, they actually uh, assist with something like that. Uh, and to wrap up this conversation about ACP in, in our segment is Yvette Brooks. Yvette is doing phenomenal work in Brevard. 
Uh, our initiative is really throughout all of Western North Carolina, but Yvette has done a phenomenal job of creating a program called Through the Trees, where she works with uh, seniors and others in providing uh, equipment and training. And so I'm going to turn it over to Yvette. Hi, everybody. It, um, it's right here, right that button there. there. All right. Um, thanks for inviting me here today. I just want to tell a couple stories uh, about Through the Trees. We started in 2020 when um, students in our county were sent home to learn virtually. And that really brought about the issue of a lot of families and uh, individuals in our county didn't have internet access at home or it wasn't fast enough like Bill was talking about today. And so I have a couple stories of some senior women that we were able to help. Um, also, let me just say, we started in 2020, but since then there's been a lot of growth of helping folks with getting connected to the internet, providing devices, and now we have our own center where folks can come in and get one-on-one -on -one help with applying for these subsidies and also digital literacy support. Um, it's become so much more than when we first started. So here's one of the women. 70, um, oh, yes. Okay, so we had one woman that was 77 years old living alone in a rural part of the county. And she found out about us through um, the local food pantry that we have in town, which was the first place that we went to for um, making connections and getting referrals. Um, and she uh, came to us and said, I need help with the internet. And so we were able to get her approved for the ACP because in our county, there was no marketing for this program at all. So it felt really good to get her approved. And then after we um, got her signed up, we had to print out her application because she didn't have a computer or a printer at home and then she had to walk to the local provider because in our county our provider makes you go in person so wherever you are in Transylvania County you have to figure out Monday through Friday 8 to 5 how to physically get there I'm working with them to see if we can make it be digital or an email but for right now you can't and so she was really thrilled when she got her internet discount and then went and told her girlfriend that lives right down the street so she's 72 year old woman also got qualified as a low income household and her issue was the provider was changing from cable for TV channels to all streaming and she had never had internet at home. So we helped her understand all the steps that were going to be coming. She needed to get internet access. We got her the ACP program. She, her TV was too old. And so we had a TV that was provided to us that had an HDMI port so that you could stream with the fire sticks. So we explained what that meant. <laughs> and um, we got her approved and she got her TV. And so then she was messing around with that. And then um, a little bit later, we were able to get her a laptop because at the time we had a little bit of a backlog log waiting for laptops. And so when she came a month later for her laptop, she was able to tell us that she was really thrilled because she loved her fire stick. It was one of the newer ones and you could press a button and then it could go right to her channel. So she really was feeling empowered. When she first came to us, she was just upset that everything was changing, you know? And then the third woman that we've helped recently, well, kind of a while back actually, we um, helped her with the internet, with the, the ACP, and she has eight grandkids that kind of come and go to her house often that live in the county. And so she, it was really important for her to have the internet access and be able to keep it on because she wanted to help them with their schooling. And since we've opened up our center, she started coming more often um, for digital literacy support too which is really great. And we've seen her a few times now. So she's empowered with her device and her internet and able to come and ask us questions. That's it. Thank you. And we skipped over the one part of that one slide, um, Yvette, I'm afraid to try and go back, but uh, donations are welcome. And uh, 
What Yvette is doing in Bavard, we do not have in Buncombe County. Uh, and it is a huge need. And so uh, this is something that we would like to see. Now, Lando Sky is putting in a grant application to get some federal dollars to do some of this. But right now, Bavard and what Yvette is doing is far ahead of what we're doing here. So I don't know that we have time for Q&A or whether we want to do this at the end. Do we have anybody online uh, that uh, has a question or a comment? Um, and I don't know who I'm waiting for to tell me that answer. Is there a voice? Am I going Lennon, to are there any questions queued up? There are no questions in the chat right now, no. And nobody wants me to go over those slides one more time. So nope. uh, we will. Uh, well, I'll uh, ask one question since I'm holding on to the mic here. Uh, who funds Through the Trees? That sounds like a brilliant program. And, and the fact it's not in Buncombe County makes me or prompts me to ask that question. Yvette, come up. Yeah, come on up. Great question. So we started um, through private donations of folks in the county that were excited about what we were doing. And then uh, we started grant writing and secured a couple grants. And now with the shop, we have um, items for sale. So we're starting to diversify. But we're accepting computers, tablets, cell phones, somewhat modern TVs, and we're located at 470 Asheville Highway, Suite B in Brevard, if you'd like to come down and see us and make a donation. And I think also Bill said we could do something through NC Ollie. Works maybe, or Ollie, yeah. I may have missed it, but it sounds like you must operate under an organization or is through the trees all by itself. Oh, wow. It, it's all by itself, and we use Yvette as our role model, okay? And uh, she's just doing such a, a nice job there. Well, that prompts me to ask question? a follow-up th to that then. Uh, I, I realized from an earlier slide you're working in tandem with Land of Sky on some of your work. Yes. Is Land of Sky inclined to embrace what you're doing through the trees and be able to, if you would, real, uh, regionalize what you're doing throughout Western North Carolina, or perhaps the Dogwood Foundation? Dogwood was um, one of our, it was our largest grant we secured so far. They're really excited. We had a mid-year grant report and they are just so happy with how we're doing because we've been exponentially busier since we started. Every little new thing that we add, there's so much need for it and it just keeps growing and how many folks need our help. And so we, halfway through the year, we are past like our goal already. Um, and what was the question you said? Other oh, other regional support. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Jan January, um, we officially expanded outside of Transylvania County, so we're working. We're able to help more regionally now, which is great because there's other counties that have devices that they can provide and need the support, and and Bill's helping with that. That's great to hear because social indicators of health is a big issue for Dogwood. And if you have, as you showed earlier in your slide, how fundamental broadband is, they're in a position to be inclined to wanting to connect that to health issues, housing issues, transportation issues, et cetera. So from a health standpoint, we sure applaud that. Yeah. Dogwood has been very um, uh, good to work with. They're kind of limited because, and this is the state law in, in North Carolina and federal law, they cannot fund a private ISP to expand their coverage, okay? Uh, and so they're pretty limited into, and, and they need to focus their dollars on nonprofit organizations, i.e. people like Yvette. Uh, they have funded the plans for uh, each of the regional, or each of the counties in their 17 county area. Uh, and so they've been, they've been players, and I think there's gonna be an announcement January 26th at their webinar you see that they're one of the sponsors of that webinar. So Dogwood has been very uh, supportive. And a lot of the leadership has come from the Land of Sky Regional Planning Council and in the southwest part of, the, of Western North Carolina, the Southwest Commission. And these are regional planning groups. They are not funded to do this. I mean, they receive no funding from the state government or federal government for broadband. This is all kind of pieced together uh, by their employees. And uh, we owe a great debt uh, to the Land of Sky folks. 
when we first got into this six years ago, we created the West Next Generation Network Project, which was to follow what was going on in Raleigh. And they were called the Next Generation Network, and we're going to be the West Next Generation Network. And so you will find on the event on the 26th, we turn that over to the Regional Planning Council, and you will see on their flyer and stuff that it's supported by the West Next Generation Network. So uh, we work hand in hand with them, and we try and work on the policy thing, and with students, they work on governmental relations and with government employees. So thank you. You can see why Yvette is on, and I'm to turn this over now to the rock star of healthcare, uh, Karen Sanders. You know, Karen and I have really gotten acquainted because her version of uh, PowerPoint was 2001, and uh, it didn't quite fit my version of PowerPoint, which was 2005. So uh, we finally got that coordinated for this presentation. So I think a lot of people here know her. She's taught advocacy courses here at, at OLLI. Uh, she has worked 40 years in the registered nurse uh, arena and is a very strong advocate. And she's going to talk about the real world experiences uh, that seniors face on health care. So without further ado, Kara, it's yours. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Hello, everyone. It's good to speak to you today. Just want to talk a little bit about some data about elders living in North Carolina. This data is from the North Carolina Aging Population Division of Aging Services. So just want to share some data with you that of all the people who are 60 years old and older, 81% of us have one or more comorbidities. So we have a lot of reason to go to the internet to find other information. And roughly about 12% reported one fall and 19% percent reported two falls in the last year. This is a, a, a more of an explanatory graphic that 81 percent have uh, one or more comorbidities of all of us. And then you'll see that nearly one in four have trouble walking and you'll also see the five or six leading cause of death in our uh, age group um, diseases of the heart has always been at top, and second is cancer, and third is COVID has crept up. And we know that another metric that's interesting is one out of four of us age 65 and older live alone, and that research links living alone with isolation and with premature mort mortality, blood pressure and heart disease, chronic health conditions, depression and anxiety. And um, there's a great set of data on this website, but you can see that overall in the state of North Carolina, we have 2.4 million people uh, who are over the age of 60, and that's about 23% of our population. Here in Buncombe County, we have 75,000 people over the age of 60, and in Henderson, it's 40,000. In um, Madison County, it's 6,600. And in Transylvania, it's 12,800. All total, it's 135,000 people who are 60 years or old, years and older. Uh, this is another interesting metric uh, that seniors are really using the internet. Approximately 66% of us go to the internet for health-related information compared to a paltry 14% of us that use the internet in 2000. And this also shows you some age ranges that seniors are using the internet. And in the first house graphic, that 66% of those age 65 to 69 use the internet. So what are people using the internet for if you are looking at age and or health issues? And we know that telemedicine has become an important factor in being able to connect with our providers of any sort uh, for any reason. And here you can, or let me just see a show of hands, how many use telemedicine in the audience? Wow, look at all those hands, all right, <laughs> 100%. So um, in my own world, I've used wound care and my own primary care doctor had a horrible accident in Bent Creek and uh, tripped on a rock and fell and had 10 staples 
in my knee. Uh, this was two years ago, and then because I was using the wrong antibiotic cream, I had to call my wound care provider and say, can I take a picture of this so you can maybe make a consult on my, in, while I was in my car getting ready to go to a uniform store, and she said, Karen, whatever you're using on that wound, that is not good. You need to stop using that because you have a lot of inflammation in this wound that uh, needs to, you need to stop using the preparation. We know that a COVID, when COVID was present, there were a lot of changes in practice patterns of healthcare providers. And actually that's one good thing about COVID is a lot of healthcare providers started seeing people with telemedicine. And also uh, going back to what Bill said, having access to healthcare is a social determinant of health and it's important to have that. <clears throat> so my experience as an RN patient advocate uh, I'm going to just talk about the places where I point seniors and my clients for health care and a lot of them uh, go, a lot of us go to information on diseases, signs and symptoms. We look at skilled nursing facilities. We have uh, 32 skilled nursing facilities just in Buncombe County alone. I'll talk more about that in a minute. The government provides one to five star ratings on those. We can also, the federal government implemented in 2000, a mandatory law that every hospital has to provide a cost estimator on their website so people can go and get an estimate of how much things cost. And then there are Medicare and Medicaid, uh, Medicare Advantage plans that are very difficult to understand. And then there are medication information and then there's physician and primary care providers. And then let's just talk about access to the internet, which um, Bill and Yvette and, um, have talked about, and that's access to the internet. Who is your uh, available internet service provider? What is the cost of your, what's the monthly cost of having internet in your home? And some people, it's extremely expensive. Um, and do you have adequate speed for computer, computer and Wi-Fi? <clears throat> so is it 25 megabits per second uh, downloading or is it 1.5 megabits uh, for upload speed? And also, what's the age of our equipment? What, how old are our cell phones? How old are our laptops? How old are our PCs? Uh, are they slower, older? And uh, the equipment is going to vary by processor and memory speed. So um, in January, I was doing a giant presentation and I had to uh, upload a tremendous number of slides and I could not get it to work at my house. So I hauled off and drove to the Fairview Library. And in the parking lot, this was on Sunday, in the parking lot, you can see by this picture that it says, you can see the Fairview Library and it says pre -Wi -Fi, free Wi-Fi zone, you've got your user ID, library guest, and the password is read more. So I just got out my cell phone and I did a speed test in the Fairview Library on Sunday when it was closed. And my goodness, the download speed was 20.7 and the upload speed was 43.4. So I sat there for an hour and uploaded these 10 giant documents in an hour. Whereas my house, I would have still been there. Also, where do I, Karen Sanders, go for troubleshooting and for instruction on how to use everything regarding the, the internet. So there is a great place, Charlotte Street Computers, that does have free classes and you can go there to get some troubleshooting, but it's gonna cost you. So that is an issue for elders trying to get help. Okay, let's see. So let's talk about access to help. So some of us have our family and our spouses and our children, our 10 year olds, to uh, help us with our internet. And then we have social friends, network, and neighbors. And then we have community resources. Again, the library system is phenomenal in terms of giving you extremely adequate um, internet access. And then there's immediate, so immediate training and troubleshooting are key. And then Bill has indicated the North Carolina Department of Information Technology has got a suggested virtual connecti connectivity hub resources available. So this is the most challenging thing for our community is how can we train elders 
and how can we help them with troubleshooting their equipment. <clears throat> so I want to talk just briefly about some of the um, pieces of info where elders can get information about their health. One of my favorites is to get mayoclinic.org on your, as an app on your phone. I have it on my phone. I recommend all my clients have it. And you can readily go there and get all kinds of information. You will see down here at the Mayo Clinic, you see a blue thing that says healthcare information. And uh, also there's an app called Medscape, which gives you tremendous information about your uh, medication side effects onset of action, duration of action. And now, um, right here I'm showing you Medicare.gov Nursing Home Compare. This is a fabulous website where any nursing home in the entire country can be accessed on this website on a one to five scale overall score and then for three or four other dimensions to look at staffing. I'll talk about that in a bit. So here, is the, is the website, <clears throat> and you'll see Aston Park Healthcare Center has got an overall star rating of five stars, and you'll see Stone Creek Health and Rehab, which is on Victoria Road, has a score of four stars, okay? And when you drill down into Aston Park, the very most important variable in a nursing home is staffing scars staffing stars. So again, going back to 32 skilled facilities in Buncombe County, there are only about five facilities that have four or five star ratings. The rest are much less than three stars for staffing. And then there are all these other amazing um, gadgets we have for pedometer apps, Apple Watches, EKGs, alarms, falls, a medic alert buttons that people are wearing around their neck, uh, senses if you've fallen and calls 911, and then back to the medicare.gov forward slash nursing home compare site. And then the fifth challenge is accessing patient portals. Uh, a lot of us know that accessing patient portals will test your nerves to the maximum, okay? So some of us have a primary care doctor, that's one, Let's say you're having a heart problem, so you got a cardiology, that's uh, patient portal number two. If you're having uh, upset stomachs or problems with your pancreas, that's uh, portal number three. So some people have as many as five to 10 portals that they have to manage. And <clears throat> sometimes when you do a portal, you'll get an email, so you have to be conversant in email about how to use the portal. And then, what are the types of portals? So my doctor chooses for me to go and have my lab drawn at LabCorp, which is an app that I can find on my phone, but I have to have an email, I have to have a user ID, and I have to have a password. And where in the world are we keeping all those, all those things? So your primary care uh, physicians got the same, so do your specialists, so does urgent care, and so for me, I keep my, all of my passwords, my user IDs, and my emails in my contact for that particular place. So for LabCorp, in the notes section, I put my email, I put my password, and I put my um, user ID. So how to access medical records is another conundrum. Uh, some people in the audience are laughing about this because this is not fun. But uh, to go and get your medical records is somewhat problematic. And um, you have to usually go to the site's website and you have to get the form that they use and then you have to complete it. And then some of them say, and yes, you need to fax that to us. Well, how many of us have fax machines in our homes anymore? Not many. So I'm just gonna talk a little bit about uh, some other key factors about advocating for patients so I'm going to talk about seven major questions requiring broadband access and why patients and families are asking for help in their health care. So this is a graphic. I was very sick in the hospital and I want to get my medical records, but I don't know how to get them. How can you help me? So invariably I go to Mission's website and um, there's, you can see that graphic up here 
And then on the second side over here, you're going to see step two, look at patients and visitors. You're going to click on that. Then you're going to click on medical records. And then it comes to this screen. So click on your authorization for medical records. So then you get this form right here. This is now, uh, doesn't have Mission Hospital on it anymore. It's an address from Nashville. So this is the updated request for medical records from Mission Health. So the key thing is, again, is if you're lost and you don't know how to use this, call this number and always ask for a paper copy because sometimes the hospital will send you a CD or DVD and guess what we don't have in our computers? We don't have readers for that information. So I always say get yourself a paper copy. Um, a client said, I had a scary experience in my skilled nursing facility or hospital. I want to complain to a federal uh, facility. Can you help me? So in your browser, you might say make a complaint about a hospital. And actually, we have a department in the state of North Carolina that does, that does just this. This is the North Carolina Division of Health and Health Services Complaint Intake and Healthcare Personnel Investigation Section. So I actually keep this number on my cell phone. Down here you will look and see it's a 1-800 number and uh, you will see that it's, this place is open from 9 to 12 Monday through Friday and 1 to 4 in the afternoon. <clears throat> and they will take your complaint and they will get back to you uh, about what they found. Something is wrong with my stomach. I, my MD wants me to have a CT scan of the abdomen with contrast. I don't have insurance. How do I look up how much one of these costs at a hospital? So they have ordered a CT of the uh, abdomen with contrast. And uh, just as an example, I give mayoclinic.org uh, the site to my patients so they can kind of see what, what it looks like. So you can see over here, this is an estimate for abdomen and pelvis with and without contrast. And in this case, the um, average amount is $2,073 for someone who has no insurance. If you have insurance, you're going to have deductibles and all kinds of other things. So this is another one. Then how much does it cost for me to go get a COVID shot or a COVID test at CVS Minute Clinic? And what are the reviews on the one closest to me on Merriman Avenue? So if you'll see down here, there's a whole list of things, but you can get a, C a COVID antibody test for $69. And here is your COVID test down here for $39. And it looks like Merriman Avenue to get your uh, COVID information is pretty popular. It's kind of helpful. So what is a normal A1C and is my result of 7.0 normal? So a lot of patients say, I don't understand this lab work. What does it measure, et cetera, et cetera. So you can go down here on this website. This is Mayo Clinic Health Information and there's an alphabet. And when you click A, comes up A1C, then it shows you what the results that below 5.7% is normal. It's, if it's higher than uh, 5.7 to 6.4, you might have a diagnosis of prediabetes or higher. You're going to need to have some special tests. So this is a handy place to get information on tests and services. Um, I can hardly walk. My doctor says I need a hip replacement. Is there a picture that shows what my hip looks like? And what does a hip replacement look like? So I love this feature. This shows a person with a pretty gnarly looking hip joint that's pretty swollen and has, looks like barnacles. And then after, it shows the insertion of a new hip. So in working with health and um, with multiple people, I always say, never, 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 never give in. This was a Winston Churchill quote that I always love to quote. And then lastly, in Scotland and Edinburgh, going through the airport, there was actually this thing that said a disruption desk. And I thought, are you kidding me? It's a disruption desk. And it's got all these scary looking things like emergency exit and all this red equipment over here and gates closed. So this is kind of the doors we have to go through 
in terms of broadband access, really realizing it's a little disrupted, but we have places like Brevard are doing great things through the woods, so I think there's hope for us. So with that, I'm gonna just say our key points here, where should we go from here? We need about 10,000 EVETs all over our county to um, have accessible hardware that we can access. Is there any more grant money available for seniors to have access to broadband? Is there any grant money for us to have training and, and um, tutoring? And can we get a system in place in Buncombe County like Transylvania's got? So I'm turning it over to Bill. And questions? Yes, Kitty. <clears throat> Um, I'm curious about home care. Um, about 10 years ago, there was a lot of noise about outfitting homebound elders in particular, but home now, people who were homebound, particularly out in rural areas, and how could we connect them in a way that their vitals could be known by a doctor here in Asheville or wherever, and they could, they could receive care in what was not even called telemedicine back then, but something like that. What is being done to help those folks? So the answer is that um, in at least two home care organizations here, they're already monitoring electronically people's vita signs and other lab work. And I can't remember the application off the top of my head, but they're already doing telemedicine in homes with home care. So just saying it's already there. They, have they obviously have broadband, yeah. Other questions? Lemon, are there any questions in the chat? There are none in the chat, no. Thank you, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm turning this over to Bill. Thanks, Bill. Thank okay. you, Karen. It's a very well-behaved group in the chat room. Uh, thanks for behaving yourself and not asking really uh, <laughs> challenging questions uh, with that. Uh, Mark Zarnecki was going to present, and I mentioned before he came down with COVID. Uh, I talked to him this morning, and he was coughing and didn't sound very good, and he said, stay away. Uh, I think the room would clear immediately if he were to show up. So Mark's not going to make a presentation, but many of you know Mark. In fact, I met Mark uh, at a Ollie class here a number of years ago, and he has done a lot of work here in Buncombe County and in the region. Uh, on digital literacy and helping close the digital divide. More, a more interesting project, an interesting project that Mark was involved in uh, was in training people at the homeless center in downtown Asheville because they needed broadband access to apply for grants, to apply for jobs, to access the world. And he was right there uh, providing that training. And now he's working at Land of Sky and working with a program called Guided Compass to help people uh, be employed. So if Mark were here, he would talk a lot more eloquently about these various services that are online. And in fact, because he isn't here, we asked Mark to uh, put together a uh, handout that has links to all the things that we have talked about today. So uh, we will leave that for the people here in the room and leave it here at Ollie so people can access. Now, I'm gonna give Mark a hard time because I think you have to be 20 years of age to read this. Uh, Karen told me in my slides I had to make sure the font was bright and bold and big uh, because uh, we were dealing with a more experienced audience. But uh, this, uh, you'll, you can figure it out. So we have that. Uh, we also have available that we'll have here at Ali handouts on the flyer on the ACP uh, program. Uh, so in uh, Mark's uh, presentation, I thought you'd be fascinated with this. Mark is really into technology, and I was talking about 5G. And this isn't really on target with healthcare, but this is so interesting to me. NORAD has this link uh, that you can go and you can see in real time uh, the world uh, and where the satellites are that are uh, rotating uh, throughout the world, okay? And you can zero right in to uh, North Carolina. And I don't know how this is, uh, being transmitted by the folks that are uh, on, the, on the Zoom call. Uh, but here you can see in this, uh, all of the satellite information goes through Gaffney, South Carolina. 
uh, but you will find uh, various satellites, and these will be in real time as they fly over the area. Uh, and you can be hypnotized by this. You can just sit there and, and stare at this. The, the world has just uh, changed so dramatically uh, over the years. And so uh, just zeroing in here, these are a satellite. So this is a satellite. You can see the satellite moving. So that's the satellite that's going across our part of the world right now, and it's communicating uh, with Gaffney, South Carolina. So uh, part of the genius of Starlink is to have all these satellites synchronized in their data and their information. So it's a whole new world. It's an exciting world that we live in, uh, and uh, it'll be even more exciting as we go ahead. Now, when I was a younger guy, I would occasionally be asked to talk at churches, and I was told at the time that a good sermon covers three and a maximum of four points. Uh, and if you go beyond four points, you've lost the congregation. Well, so I was laughing with Karen earlier uh, yesterday. I said, you know, we've gone through all this stuff. I wonder if anybody remembers anything uh, about this. But I know this is an incredibly smart group. And so I've come up with five things. Uh, and if you have an interest, see how close you are in your five points to my five points of what I've heard us uh, say and what... Uh, uh, I think the overall summary is. One is the internet is here. It's affecting absolutely everything we do. There is not an aspect of our life that is not impacted in some way by the internet. And having access to the internet is just increasingly important. We're also seeing great progress in building the infrastructure. We're behind the world, but we're catching up on building the physical infrastructure uh, of the internet. Uh, and because of that, a lot of attention is now being shifted on the point three to uh, the digital divide and trying to help people uh, that don't have resources, that don't have the equipment, that don't have the knowledge, uh, that don't have the wherewithal to interact with the digital world to be successful uh, in that interaction. And that te internet technology in healthcare is a major asset. Uh, but at the same time, it's a major problem uh, because you saw that one chart that Karen presented that people over 80, a very nice group, uh, but only 28% had an internet contract with a service provider. Uh, and I'm guessing that if you were to use that statistic back to 30-year-olds, it's going to be, in fact, uh, I happen to know this, in Ingham County, it's 87% of the public have a contract for the entire public in Ingham County. Well, only 28% among people that are 80 years of age or older. Um, and number five is that work remains to be done. And I was really delighted that Yvette was able to join us. And Karen's last points about we really need to go to work on providing services for seniors in helping them connect uh, to this internet world. Uh, and we have a grant in, the Land of Sky has put a grant in for $300,000 to do some of this with the federal government. Cross our fingers, we hope we can get that. But if not, we're going to have to rely on foundations, we're going to have to rely on individual contributors and organizations. At one time, Goodwill used to provide a refurbishing of computers and of assisting people. They no longer do that. Uh, at one time, AB Tech used to do that type of thing, and they no longer do it. So as we sit here in Ingham, in, I used to live in Ingham County, in Buncombe County, uh, as we sit here in Buncombe County, we are short of having that kind of assistance uh, that we uh, need. And so speaking to Ali, I would say this would be a phenomenal new initiative for Ali really to get involved in not only helping your members understand this world, but helping the public at large. So that's kind of wraps up uh, what we have. Um, we are running a little bit ahead of schedule. Um, I spoke to a group in Michigan one time and people paid like $50 to come and hear the speakers. And uh, I was the last speaker of the day. It was like 4.15 in the afternoon. We were scheduled to go to 4.30. And I asked, uh, I said, well, I got done. And I said, is it OK if we quit a little bit early? And one person raised their hand and said, no, 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 I paid my $50. I want to get my whole value worth. Uh, and uh, everybody looked kind of agitated. So 
I said, let's take a vote. And he was the only person that voted to stay around. So uh, I don't know. Well, let's just open it up for any questions at the end of this. Any last points, uh, Karen, you want to make? Any last points, Bill, you want to make? Uh, Yvette? Uh, before you go to the chat, though, I will take you up on your offer, um, Bill. Oh, um, I see, in the chat. OK. OK, you can go there first. Do, 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 do. Terrific, sir. Oh, you're. Uh, your husband signed in. Oh, that's Susan Jackson. Well, thank you for the nice comments. That's why you wanted me to show that, you bet. <laughs> <laughs> now I know. So anyway, open, open floor. Good. One question I was just asked is, are the slides going to be available for all the members to get on site? Absolutely. And I requested that it be recorded because, uh, because of the scheduling and everything. Uh, our numbers are kind of down. So we uh, have it recorded, I believe. Is that right, Lemon, uh, Lennon up on the control booth? You who? Lennon, are you with us? So she told me it was going to be recorded, so I think we have it recorded and uh, it'll be available. We, it is recorded. Okay, Lennon's on the job. All right, Yvette? That's a good sales pitch here because we don't have services here. If you have, like I have, I'm going to donate a, a laptop uh, to, um, to Yvette, and uh, I, I use it maybe once a year for something like that. And so I will make that donation. But what they will do is guarantee that they'll wipe the computer clean and any of your personal information will be destroyed. Uh, and you don't have to worry about that. And uh, that's an important aspect to all this because we all have that information that's on there that we don't even know. Kitty? I'll ask a question. Oh, uh, just not, I, Kitty had a question oh, behind sorry. you over here. I was just thinking that I'm probably not alone in having several computers that ought to find a new home. And it would be a great thing. We collect batteries at Ollie. We ought to collect those too. Yeah and get them to Transylvania County. Amen. If, if Ali would be willing to do that, that would be a great uh, service. Because we all, and, and Yvette, do you want to talk at all about age? I mean, there's got to be like a computer from 1965 probably isn't very helpful. Um, Okay, any age, any age, you Yeah, so right now we're accepting computers from all ages. It's really fun to see old technology, and we have a, a space in the shop to have it almost kind of like, um, not a museum, but you know, to see like technology over time, right? We were very excited to see some flip phones, some Blackberries, you know, we have an old um, it Packard It seems like new Bell. technology to me, you gotta understand. <laughs> well, yeah, we like to see all of it, so we'll help you. Um, wipe it yep one thing the audience would not have any idea about but when i was in the state legislature in michigan we created a bulletin board system for constituents to communicate with my office and it was the first in the country and we got written up in national magazines and was on national news and etc and we ran it out of an old vector graphic uh, computer and i gave it to an uh, aide that would worked for me well, about two years ago, I learned that he had donated my vector graphic to the Michigan State University Computer Museum. Uh, and if that doesn't make you feel old, you know that <laughs> something that you worked on is now a museum, a relic uh, that's out there. But Yvette will accept relics, so I'll go and see if I can get my, uh, my vector graphic back and see what we do. So a question I'm, I'm concerned about is, is rural health care, obviously a big issue in Western North Carolina. Um, you've shared with us both broadband expansion via cable, or fiber, sorry, um, and also via Starlink. These both have, what, a different role? I mean, Starlink seems very attractive if you don't have to get that fiber cable down the road a piece to just one household, uh, you know, a mile from here. Uh, is there any way of parsing that in terms of the public planning for the distribution of broadband? You, you put your finger on the central problem of broadband in the mountains, okay? And so where there are population centers, i.e. Asheville, where we are, you will find fiber that is gonna be distributed and you'll find 
you know, different options of, of accessing that. Now there are pockets where there's not available, but it's, that's being filled in. You get outside of Asheville, let's take, I live in Biltmore Lake, and you go two miles directly west into Hominy Valley and Davis Creek Road and in that area where the new state park is, uh, you will find that you don't have the same access. You can access AT&T where they have their old telephone lines and you can get five megabits down and one up. Okay, and that's two miles from where we live. Okay, so you saw, I, th I threw that 500 in there just to make Karen feel bad, but uh, it, 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 it just drives you a little ways and you, you don't get that. Now, how do you fill that in? Because it's like $8,000 $80, a mile to lay fiber through the rocks and stuff in the mountains. And so you have different solutions like the fixed wireless that beams down from a tower, uh, that's wireless, or the satellites that come down. Uh, you don't have the same speeds there, and you don't have what is called, uh, uh, the, I'm, I'm not going to say this right, the, the synchronous talking back and forth. So your lip motion might not match the words because you're the, the pinging uh, numbers. In fact, I'll show you on, on one of these cell phones, you'll see a ping uh, a milliseconds there, and that talks about how you know, these machines are talking back and forth. And you don't have that with the satellite connections or the uh, uh, other systems. And Yvette had something you wanted to add to answer that, because this is the world that Transylvania County is in. So with Starlink, I've been watching, um, there's a residential plan, there's a business plan, an RV, and a marine option. And in our region, Starlink residential and business are available, but only at best effort speeds. So it might be slower than DSL, it might be high speed, and I've seen one person's home, kind of past Conesty, if you know where that is, where they got the device in September and they took a lot of snapshots and it's, you know, from 4, 20, 30, and then it was way off the charts, over 150 for the speed. Um, and what's great about it is you can pause the service if it's just not fast enough for you and you want to wait a few months, um, but it is available now, kind of. Kind of. <laughs> well, what, uh, I like what Mark showed on the uh, dynamic nature of these satellites because as I understand it, and I'm, I'm not an expert on this thing, but as I understand it, the, the satellite's going over us at, at some point, okay. At, at an angle, as it starts its access, you're going to have slower speeds than when it's right ab above you. And then you have the problems of the uh, company having the satellites talk to each other and getting it all uh, synchronized. And so those issues will become less and less as more satellites are stuck up there in the air. And so right now you get different uh, results uh, with one contract based upon weather conditions, based upon where the satellite is in the sky. Uh, and it, it's a whole new world that way. Now as we worry about 5G on the telephone, 6G is under design right now. So that's going to be even faster uh, as we come. And our overall goal is to get Karen Sanders some decent Wi-Fi uh, out where she lives. So. With that, I think time is up. If anybody doesn't object, uh, we will end 10 minutes early. For those, we did have a chat here that came in that asked, will the video be available? And I think it will be, but I don't know exactly the distribution system here at Ollie uh, for doing that. Is somebody, uh, okay, Lennon has the answer to that. Um, if you put your email in the chat, I can send it to you. Um, I can send the recording to whatever email you leave. And you'll probably put it in a newsletter or something like that, I would presume. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> See how it looks. <laughs> so we don't, we don't know, but Karen can handle that. All right, and with that, so thank you uh, for participating in this, and it's been delightful. And uh, for Claire and Yvette, thanks for coming up. And Karen, thanks for your good work. Thank you. Thank you.
Fast and Furious. <laughs> <laughs>